My name is Mark Loparco. I'm the director of UM Dining at the University of Montana. And I also happen to be currently the president of the National Association of College and University Food Services. Yeah, the UM Farm to College program is uh, one of the first in the country. Uh, we started in 2003. Uh, it started from a conversation that I had with one of the professors from the Environmental Studies program, Neva Hassanen. Uh, we had a conversation, at, we were both on the Recycling Oversight Committee meeting, and she asked me a question about local food and what my thoughts were about it. Uh, and I have always, since traveling to Italy, eh, liked the idea of local food, and I associated what that means to communities. Uh, and so uh, I said I, I would really like to get more involved in purchasing local food, but I don't have the staff to do it, frankly. And she then hunted down for me four of her grad students. And then we began the, began the planning of uh, an all-local food meal. And on May 3rd, I think it was in 2003, uh, we had our first event called Montana Mornings, and it was all local uh, food. And from there, uh, the program has really blossomed into something that is very sustainable uh, and a pretty well-known program throughout the country. Well, there's a couple of reasons that I think that it's important to go. One, uh, my moral compass is based in the right thing to do. So the first test is this is the right thing to do. But why is it the right thing to do? Well, it's the right thing to do because uh, communities have lost, in many communities, they've lost their local food uh, system. And uh, Missoula happens to be a very good example of that. In the uh, 50s, 70% of the food that was produced and eaten by uh, people in the valley was produced in the valley and now it's something like 10 percent uh, and so there's a reliance on agribusiness and my concern with that is is that that's where I see this country as being food insecure uh, that there are six or seven companies and all the food uh, travels through those world food travels through those companies and so yeah, we've got enough people in the world that we need agribusiness. I think we need responsible agribusiness, but I think it's more important that communities go back to what made them successful for centuries, or centuries, I guess. Uh, certainly, as we got into more urban communities, um, the whole glue, if you will, was the food system and the interconnectedness between the people and uh, the production of food and the consumption of food and the social aspect of that. Uh, we've lost that. We've lost it um, in terms of family um, and I think it's replaced with you know, you know, going out to dinner but that's different than uh, I think what a, a strong vibrant local food system uh, produces. Oh, the food supply was 93% uh, of the food that we served was through a, a wholesaler from anywhere in the world. Uh, there was no conscious, pointed, uh, purposeful uh, effort to uh, buy local food prior to that. So in other words, 7% just happened to be stuff that was foods that were produced uh, locally. Uh, now we're purchasing over 20% of our food on a three million dollar budget uh, and locally being def local being defined as the state of Montana. So one of the purposes of our program was to strengthen the agricultural economic development in the state of Montana. Uh, and uh, now we have uh, over, we're purchasing over $800,000 annually in local food uh, from 134 to 170, depending on the time of the year, 
uh, food producers. And we're not talking about, we're talking about agricultural food products. Um, some people, you know, we could claim Coca-Cola as local food. We know that our local bottler buys their sugar from Billings. It's a sugar beet sugar from Billings and their water's from the Missoula Aquifer. But that's not the kind of sustainable agriculture that we're, that we're talking about. We're talking about real uh, farm and ranch products and mm -hmm. value-added products. And when we started this program, everyone said that uh, it's going to be more expensive. It costs too much. That was the uh, uh, easiest excuse not to do it by some of the schools. And there's other schools within the state that aren't doing it. But purely on the anecdotal uh, thinking that it's going to cost more. Yes, some items cost more, but other items cost less. So we've been at it now for 11 years, and I've been tracking our food cost uh, records that whole time, and we're either at or below industry standards. It has not cost us more to do this. Now, in fact, depending on how you define cost, in terms of the value to our student guests, uh, what price do you put on that? And so from my standpoint, let's take um, uh, oil. We cook with safflower oil from Montana for everything. We deep, you know, students are going to eat fried fruit, fried food. So uh, we deep fat fry in it. We make our salad dressings with it. We saute with it. We have two oils, olive oil, which you can't get from Montana, uh, but it's essential. Uh, and um, safflower oil. Now, I could buy significantly less expensive oil to fry in. It's also significantly more harmful to your health. So when you talk about cost, and I have a registered dietitian on staff, and uh, she told us, if you're gonna uh, fry foods, this is the best oil for our students. So, you know, it depends on how you look at things. Uh, from my standpoint, it's, it's because it's healthier for our students, in the long term, it's, it's more cost effective uh, from a more of a global perspective. Uh, so that's an example of where, yeah, I could spend twice as much on that oil but it has other impacts. That oil that we're buying, safflower oil, also is one of the best oils, and ours is reused for uh, biodiesel fuel. So uh, we actually donate it back to the company where we buy the oil and they run their farm machinery off the oil that we've cooked in. You know, when we first started this, of course, we were pioneering in this, so uh, we've seen the obstacles. First thing was, uh, uh, teaching local farmers the difference between wholesale pricing and retail. You, you know, we can't buy at the price that they're going to sell at the farmer's market. We, we have to buy at wholesale pricing. So that was one of the first things. And then the other thing was um, teaching them all of the paperwork that's going to be required to do business with a state institution. Then there's the uh, distribution and uh, delivery of products, uh, you know, scheduling and uh, making sure that uh, they can get the products to us in a, in a time frame that we need them. But those were just, you know, they were hurdles and they were challenges, but we got over those. And one of the really cool things about this area is uh, what's the Western Montana Food Growers Co-op. That kind of um, uh, got started because of the volume that we were buying. And there's, I think there's between 34 and 40 farmers that are just growing food for the, uh, the co-op. And of course the volume that we go through, I couldn't have my food buyers call 30 farmers to get 300 pounds of tomatoes. Uh, and so this co-op started by uh, up in the uh, Flathead Valley and it's been fantastic. I mean, that one call and we can get 
all of the items that we need. And they also then began selling to the local restaurants. And now they have a very uh, viable uh, business enterprise that helps the farmers and is that good connection between the restaurateurs and, and uh, the farm. And uh, so a contract food service company like Sodexo uh, or Compass or Aramark, uh, they are corporate America. Uh, they're for profit and they will uh, go into a campus uh, and generally they will dangle a, f a sizable amount of money in infrastructure improvements for a long-term contract. Um, and again, I want to be clear that there are places for that, uh, but my concern with that is, is that uh, their allegiance is to the corporate, the corporation and their shareholders. Um, and they need to generate money. So they're making these huge contracts with buyers, uh, wholesalers from all over. So their food sources are wherever and it is based on best price. Uh, so it's a little different focus, I believe. Uh, when you're part of the campus and you're, you're of the fabric that the campus is made of, you're, you're much more in, in, in harmony, I guess, with the rhythm of the campus you, you, the needs of the students, uh, and that's just my personal feeling on that, but there's a corporate piece to that that uh, just doesn't, isn't right for our campus, let's say. Yeah, we have this thing called, um, well, we do omelets on uh, Wednesdays typically, and uh, I think it was about, I don't know, I might have been doing this for 15 years. We just started playing around and then I kind of took on this persona for uh, our students of the world famous omelet guy. And uh, it's, that's really, it's about making great food and uh, making a great omelet. But yeah, I like to see if I can put a smile on a student's face from 20 yards away, which I can do regularly. Uh, and they just have fun with it. And it breaks up the monotony. It's, it's uh, stressful for students. They got to eat in the same place for 16 weeks. And so you want to break it up and have fun with them. Yeah, I've dressed up. Uh, we've done the, uh, for Earth Week, we did the Green Man Group. You know, if you think of Blue Man Group, only all green. We did that. We've done the Beatles. We've done uh, the Rolling, we've done Rolling Stones. We've done uh, Motley Crue. We just, pick up a theme and go with it. We've done Alice in Wonderland, the Rocky Horror Omelet Show, and yes, I did wear uh, a bustier and fishnets. Uh, so we just, uh, you have know, fun. we have fun with it.